I was simple. I'm, I'm, I'm always start by saying I'm a bit of a weird animal because um, you know I started banking. I, I come from Austria, by the way. I'm from Vienna, and um, I came to Russia about 20 years ago the first time. Uh, I stumbled into banking. I never thought I'm gonna end up there. I did a lot uh, M&A restructuring as a peer called investment banking. I was the first time here in Russia 20 years ago, uh, working the gas for my bill. Uh, which is a long time ago. And today, to be here uh, as in the temple of capitalism, which is the, the Moscow Stock Exchange, I apologize, I switched over to pullover. I have a suit here, so if you uh, think I should have a suit, I can, I can switch over. Um, but in essence, uh, what I do these days after uh, basically you know, left investment banking, is A, as to the advice companies, B, I'm, I'm teaching uh, at Resh, which is really fun. Uh, this is uh, in my view, really the best institution you, you, you have in Russia. Um, it, it's really fun with the people to work there. And the other thing is, okay, art. Art is a, art is a hobby of mine, it's a passion, it's fun. Um, I've started about 20, 25 years ago to work together with some artists. I've been coached and I helped them. You know, there was a friend of mine uh, who wanted to say, oh, I wanna, I wanna build a sculpture, you know, and she needed money. And of course, she had no clue how to raise funds. And I came from bank and said, yeah, we need, uh, we need a spreadsheet and a PowerPoint presentation. I tell you as an artist, okay? So that, that's sort of how I got interested in, uh, in arts and artists and working with them because they're so different from at least where I come from. And uh, in the meantime, I, I, I did some work here, here was in Russia. You know, we had some joint project with, with uh, Garage, for example, particularly with the Austrian Cultural Institute uh, with Simon Watts here. And um, yeah, today we thought, okay, what can we do as a crossover between what is art on the one hand and sort of finance, the finance world. Uh, the idea is to look a little bit into the mechanics of the art market. Uh, as Alexei said already, you know, can you make money? How would you do money? Um, but also a little bit really how this market works. It's a very weird, unique market. By the way, I got also a list uh, last night of questions. Um, I don't know where they came from. I got like 10, 15 questions. Some I had in my presentation anyway, but afterwards we'll go through them. And, and by the way, I keep usually these things very flexible. If you get bored, tell me, yeah, we gotta move on. I have about, I don't know, 90 slides or so here. I'm not gonna show this to you, way too much. Um, about half of will walk through, okay? Some faster, some, some slower. But again, feel free to interrupt me and, and um, I'll do the, the kind of fall part more faster and then we have more time to play, yeah? So that's the idea. Good. Um, with technology, I'm not a techie. I hope this works here. Um, okay, very right. Well, to start with, I can look at the screen, so don't, you know, you can look at this as if it works. Bond shares and treasury bills are just pieces of paper. You cannot hang them on the wall, display or admiring, you know, show this to admiring neighbors. So the thing is, you know, why would you invest in art? What is art? What's the relationship between art and, you know, the finance world? Bonds, shares, you know, treasury bills and so on. Uh, when you look at this, for example, what's rapid mean is not familiar to you. Rapid mean is, what do you think this is? What does it look like? Football. Yeah, it's a football, yeah, it's a football pitch. It's, it's actually what Dino Moscow is. In Moscow, it's about rapid mean in, in Austria and Vienna, okay? And that was a share, okay? And this, this football club went public. It was one of the first in the world that went public, this small Austrian uh, club in 91. And uh, who do you think bought shares like this? It's, yeah, I mean, it's the fans, you know, it's not the institution, it's the fans. And the issue was that, well, how are these fans going to buy this? What are they going to do with it? I mean, I mean, had you been on a Saturday on a football pitch? I mean, or you have, you know, I mean, look, these people don't necessarily read research documentation, stuff like this, yeah? Um, but they're proud of their club, huh? So the idea was, what do we need to have? We definitely can't have electronic shares with them, but we had to print out shares for them. What purpose? Well, that they can hang these things on the toilet or somewhere else, you know, to basically say, okay, I'm a proud fan of this club and, and, and show this, you know. But this is quite interesting where I said, okay, how much does it have to do with art? Not necessarily, but at least you can hang it on the wall. Okay, here we start. Um, what do you think is this here? Okay, it's like $100, no, isn't it? Yeah, it's $100. Now, uh, when you look a little bit closer, um, what do you see here? 
Yeah, I see Federal Reserve note, there's something like this. Um, then you see one, how's this $100? No, $100. What is this here? It's here, the, you can't read it very well, Treasure of Thought. This is notable tender for all debts to societies. I don't, you think this doesn't look like a, a real $100 sign, right? There is an artist, uh, he, he, his name is Box, he called himself Box. He died about a year ago, in January last year. And uh, he did following. When he went, for example, to a restaurant, okay, and the bill came, and the waiter came to collect, he said, look, you have a choice. I can pay cash, I can do it. Or, and he really did, you know, like a scene, you know, I can pay with this here. And he had spent sometimes hours on creating such a banknote, you know, with pen pencil. Sometimes it was five to ten hours. It took him took him time to do this. He claims that he has never actually in his whole life sold a single of his work. He always traded them in. Okay? Now in in nine from ten cases that didn't work, you know, people want to have cash. But in some other cases that worked. And what happened then is so sometimes he, you know, gave away his piece of art. He didn't go change. I so let's assume that case, if he had dinner for, I don't know, $40, he got $60 back. What did he do next? He called one of his collectors and said, listen, you can have the receipt. I give you also the change I got. And usually he multiplied this invoice that he got as a restaurant bill about times five. And these people were happy to, to buy this, but then they had to basically go out and hunt for this note. Because in the meantime, you know, I mean, the waiter may still have it, you know, in his pocket or so, or, you know, you gotta find out where else this is. So, you know, this is a little bit the mix of, is this art? Is this money? Is this, what is money worth? Uh, what is such a, even, you know, when you have dollars in the world, in your hand, is this a hundred dollar worth? Of what is this really? And uh, the interesting thing is, of course, you can imagine this individual got sometimes in conflict with the law. No? As in the UK, as he was American, but he lived for a number of years in the UK. In the UK, for example, he once had a lawsuit in Old Bailey, which is the main court, and they said, you are basically reproducing our currency, and that's illegal. What did he say? He said, I'm not reproducing this. I mean, every piece of thing is unique, and they're all they're different, different, you know? So uh, the court didn't know really what to do with them. They had this, so maybe it was a quid, it was uh, made for free. In the US, it's the same issue. And uh, you know, in the US, they're a little bit sort of pertaining. They say, we don't know how to deal these pieces of work really, you know, what he's doing here. Either we can forbid it, because he's sort of forging your currencies, and they tried to apply the laws of pornography, you know, sort of forbid it. Or they said, nah, on the other hand, maybe this is a freedom of speech element, where they say, actually everybody's allowed to, to do or say, you know, which he wants. Um, but you see already, you know, this kind of crossover between, you know, the guy was intentionally playing with this. At the end of his life, he was actually living quite well from what he did. Uh, he also never went to the same places. So for example, restaurants, if, you know, if someone knew already what's going on, he wouldn't go to this place. So he would try out many, many other places. His experience was about in 90% of the case, it didn't work. It worked very well, for example, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, people really loved this. They didn't want to have Swisses, they rather wanted to have these pieces of work. You know? So, um, I'll switch over to this. You can imagine who this is, right? Yeah, you know this artist? It's an Andy Wall, okay? And um, I put this intentionally here because um, when I was, when I was a, a, a kind of a young banker when I started my career, uh, Morgan Stanley put me to train in New York, okay? And I was always interested in arts, I went to the galleries. And I could have bought it back in 93 for $2,000, which was a lot of money for me. I said, I mean, I was thinking hard, 2000 nah. And I, nah. And I eventually I said no, you know? How much do you think this is worth today? I just saw this in London about a couple of months ago. I said, now you pay like 
45, 50,000 for this. And I let them, you know, not only I did like this, because I, I remember the gallery said, you know, dollar sign, you banker, you know, this is, this fits, you know, you should, you should have it, you know, you should put this on your wall, no? Okay, I didn't make it, but um, I, I switched over to something else. I lost out of an opportunity, but, you know, maybe you have seen this painting uh, in, in the news over the last um, uh, couple of weeks, particularly, that's the Salvatore Mundi. Uh, people familiar with this? This is currently, uh, as I said, the most expensive painting in the world, suffice to say. It was sold um, in November last year for $450 million. I said, you know, $450 million for painting, what's going on here? Um, it's a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah? And I, I made here a quick timeline of, of Leonardo. Um, so Leonardo is typical of which, which kind of cultural area, how do we call this, the time, the period when he was in? It's the Renaissance, and he's one of the Renaissance stars, of course, yeah? And you know some of his paintings which are pretty famous. I mean, the Mona Lisa, everybody knows, okay? Um, maybe you have also seen The Last Supper, which is a fresco that we have in Milan, okay? Um, here is Salvatore Mundi on the left side, and then and we will come back to another painting, uh, which is in the left here, which is The Virgin in the Rocks. Um, now, uh, the, this, the Salvatore Mundi, he painted around 1500, okay? So which was really when he was at the, at the um, starting to be really, really well-known, well-known artist. Yeah? So, uh, I give you a little bit the story of what happened with this painting. Yeah, how is it possible that this thing is ending up with more than 50 million dollars? Um, now, this painting was painted around 1500, and it was quite likely then acquired by a French king, Louis XII, okay? Why, actually? Because the French at the time invaded uh, parts of Italy, okay, northern Italy. There was always war there, and that's horrible. So probably somewhere when they were in this region, they got in touch with Italian Renaissance. And uh, we don't know exactly for how much uh, this, was, this, this was basically uh, sold. We just know he got it. And about 120 years later, the Salvatore Mundi accompanies then one of these French noble ladies to the UK. She takes the painting with her, you know, in a package, and marries uh, King Charles I. Why, why is this important? I want to mention to you. Right now, there are two exhibitions in London where the first time for the last 500 years, again, the whole collection that Charles I had is in the museum, you know? If you can't get a ticket, kill someone for it or rob it somewhere, you know? This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see that collection again. This is happening like right now in the, in the uh, Royal Academy of Arts and then also in the Queen's Gallery, you see this. Now, uh, the interesting thing is, we come back later to this, Henrietta, who has this painting along with her, has also a copy with her, okay? And uh, this is an engravement, and on this engravement, um, there was written Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci paints it. Why is this important? The video says Leonardo painted that. Okay? Now, the thing is, this Salvatore Mundi isn't signed. Okay? Uh, the first person in the Renaissance are actually signed paintings was Albrecht Dürer, yeah, German. Yeah? He was the, uh, you, you have seen this sometime in this AD. Yeah? But before paintings weren't really, they were assigned, okay? And I come back to this why. Good, here we are. Um, Charles I is married to this Henrietta, and Charles I, uh, bad luck, uh, he, he rules basically in times when there's revolution. Oliver Cromwell comes, the monarchy is abolished, and uh, in essence, they figure also out that Charles I has an enormous amount of debt. So what they do is they sell off the whole collection he has. You know? That's why I say it's so important you can see it now again. The whole collection is scattered all over Europe and many, many things never surfaced again. However, so it's, it basically was used Salvador Mandi to pay some debt of about the value of 30 pounds at the point of time. You know? It was given away, trade off 30 pounds, finally you get to Salvador Mundi, 30, 30 pounds debt is covered, it's all fine. 
But the interesting thing is, Charles II, when the monarchy is re-established after the revolution in the UK, they try to get this collection back again, and it comes into the um, under the umbrella of Charles II again. So the painting comes back to the UK. Then this painting disappears. We don't know what happened. We don't know who had it. It was for about 150 uh, years in the um, um, in the ownership of the royal family, but afterwards we have no idea actually who had it. Um, it's resurfacing in the late 19th century. In the late 19th century, somehow it ends up in the United States, in Virginia, and uh, in 1958, it pops up at Sotheby's again, um, at an auction in London. It's being sold for 45 pounds at the point in time, taken to America again. However, it's not attributed to Leonardo. Okay? People attribute to one of his pupils. They haven't figured out because nobody had documentation, nobody had nothing about this. Yeah? They thought this is just, you know, it's a Renaissance painting, it's quite nice. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't this kind of circle of Leonardo, but that's basically it. <coughs> this is taken to America, and in 2005, this painting resurfaces again, but this time in Louisiana. There was a whole estate which is being sold off, um, basically because one of these guys that died. And there's a New York art dealer, uh, his name is Parrish, and he buys this painting for $10,000. What he does the next six years is, because he's a member of a consortium of art dealers and investors, they sometimes specialize to dig a little bit further and say, let's take a closer look at what we buy here. And uh, there is an art historian looking at this and restoring this, and they eventually figure out this is a real Da Vinci. Among others, because uh, they prove that this engraving that they also suddenly find, which I said before, this Henrietta had a painting, I had this uh, copy along with her, and said, you know, Leonardo did this. So they match these two paintings and say, yeah, this must be a real Da Vinci. So, after this uh, has been um, made authentic, it's a real one, um, the consortium around this Mr. Parrish is selling it off uh, in 2013. And they sell this to a French guy, actually uh, living in Monaco, Yves Bouvier, who is called the Freeport King. Uh, we, 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 we come back to this, what these Freeports are, but the Freeports, you must imagine, are basically warehouses full with art. Yeah, and they're usually outside jurisdictions, so they're like offshore um, tax havens. Uh, it's a private sale, so it's not auctioned off, and the deal is 75 to 80 million. We don't know exactly, because it hasn't been disclosed. What happens in the same year, Bouvier is selling on this painting to a Russian man that you're familiar with, okay? Uh, and this time, 425 plus million dollars. Uh, these two gentlemen um, then decide to go into conflict um, subsequently because uh, the Russian is of the view that the French guy has more or screwed him. Because the view was he's acting for him as an agent and uh, he said, no, no, I'm a principal. So the fact is, they are since, and that's not been settled yet, since in legal dispute. And what happens vice versa, in 2017, uh, Ruben Lovlev uh, puts up uh, the painting for sale uh, at Christie's and he makes $450 million. Why was this? Well, among others, because there were two countries, in essence, competing for this painting. The one was uh, Saudi Arabia and the other one is Qatar. And for those of you reading the press know uh, there is some kind of competition between these countries at the moment, you know, to put it politely. Um, both of them, among others, um, have uh, big, big ambitions in regard to art and art museums, so they wanted to have at least one trophy item in their respective collections. The painting goes to uh, Saudi Arabia. The interesting thing is during the bidding process, uh, the last bid, just before the final one, was by $420 million. And the Saudis got in with $30 more, and just that was it for 50. And the Qataris didn't, didn't go any further with this. So um, since then, it's now in the hands of the Saudis. And uh, I don't know whether it's shown already. I don't think so. But it will be shown pretty soon in uh, 
uh, a, a museum uh, that has uh, also recently been built um, in the capital. The moral of the story, among others, and that's something I basically read in research, is this painting is probably the first painting ever that had previously bought for more than $30 million, uh, and that's been resold as a profit. This is not the usual case. Yeah? In most of the cases, what we see, basically in all the cases which are documented, yeah, uh, if you buy something particular for such an outrageous price at an auction, uh, it's quite unlikely you're going to make money on that. Okay? I'll just start with this up front. Good. Now, nevertheless, there's no doubt about it. Uh, when you look at the history of it, particularly when you look at 1958, when this was sold for 45 pounds, then uh, purchased for 10,000 dollars, then, you know, this one deal with about 80 million, the Russian deal with 120, 450 at the end. Did we make money here? Yeah, some people made quite a lot of money here, yeah? One of the issues, we're here sort of semi-bankers or in the house of the stock exchange, we say, well, can we figure out a little bit how much, how much we made here? Well, the last six decades, people made money on this, no doubt about it, but this painting is about 500 years old, okay? So uh, the exercise we're trying to do now is look back a little bit in history and say, was this thing from the beginning till the most recent end, November, was this actually a good investment? You know, if a family or if someone had hold this over generations. Well, um, to start with, because it was also one of the questions that I got, how real is this? How real a Da Vinci is this whole thing? Um, so basically, there's a lot of work that went into this to, to make this authentic. But there are some people saying, well, you know, it's still a wreck. You know, our comment was, it's, it's because it's been overpainted many times and probably not very professionally. Um, some people believe it's basically coming off from Leonardo, maybe directly, but with this workshop. And most cynical is Michael Daly who says, well, this frame is original, probably the rest, not quite sure. Um, Let's start now a little bit with this calculation. Um, now there's actually no price record when King Louis XII, the first owner, got hold of this painting. We don't know how much he actually paid. We have no idea. Um, so what could we do? We say, well, around the same time, Mona Lisa was painted. For Mona Lisa, we know how much Leonardo, or we don't know exactly if it was him, or his heir, Francesco Medici, um, one of them sold, it was sold around 1519. But we know from the book records, the Mona Lisa was sold for 4,000 gold ducats. Yeah. Now, I don't want to go through all these calculations now in between here, but the issue is, you know, how much is this basically in value? And when you go through various steps, what is a ducat, and uh, basically how heavy is it, and what is the gold price right now. So maybe take the 4,000 gold ducats and um, look at it, how much this would have been worth just a couple of days ago, on, on March 8, 2018, um, when an ounce of gold was trading at $1,300 in New York. This would translate to just below $600,000. Yeah? Now the interesting thing is when you go back into history and you look at gold, gold only, gold is pretty stable, okay? That's the reason why gold is usually seen as an inflation hedge. Yeah? That's this old Jewish wisdom. What is it? You should basically hold your assets in what? One third cash, one third real estate and one set gold, yeah? And there's a reason behind this, yeah? And I mean, the Jews know what they're talking about because what they've been through in history, I mean, my God, you know? But among others, the gold has the beauty that you can take it with you, and the gold is also inflation hedge, as is real estate, but real estate you can't take with you. Money can take it with you, yeah? Uh, therefore, among others, gold is very stable. So we can take this very much as a benchmark, uh, these $600,000. Now, if we do this and say, okay, we invested $600,000 uh, 
in November 1519, that was when around this time when this painting was probably purchased. And we're selling this in November 2017 for 450 million dollars. How much is this? This is a yield of 1.35%. Okay, I mean, of course, we're in Russia, and the Russian economy, you know, is sometimes different. But I mean, is this attractive? It's a bit like, I mean, 1.3%. Okay, it's over a long period of time, you know, but this looks, doesn't really, really look like. I mean, I mean, so what, you know? This, is, this doesn't really look cool. Huh? Great investment. We're okay, good. We all have different opinions. That's fine. Um, if you told me this, I'd say I go for something else. It doesn't even cover inflation rates. Hmm? It doesn't even cover inflation rates. It, it, all, all, well, look, I mean, it's gold standard and gold is inflation hedge, but all, all we're saying right now is, you know, this is what you basically put in, this is what they get out, what is on 500 years, more by 3%. And when you show me this number, I would say, cool, what do you get on the savings account in Russia right now? Yeah, and you also have well, to I know, it's the inflation, but that's coming down, no? Restoration costs. Yeah, 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 sure, you're right. I mean, I mean, there are certain elements to this, uh, which, which one has to account for. But still, quite interesting. Now, here, here's, a, here's a catch. I mean, the art prices usually go very much in cycles. We you know there's booms and busts, you know, it's a bit more volatile thing. But over time, and we will look then at the, at the last hundred years, sort of, over time, art has basically outperformed cash bonds and gold but underperformed equity. And, and again, at the end of the, uh, of the session, we'll look at a little bit more detail at this. Um, so when we, when we say art overall has yielded somewhere around two to two and a half percent over the last 100 years, yeah? then we have cash, gold, about one-ish, uh, UK bonds about um, you know one and a half, Italian stocks, two US stocks about six percent. So we can a little bit put there where, where's art, okay? So art is rather on the on the lower mid uh, kind of tier um, in, in, in this comparison with other uh, investment opportunities. Good. Let's do another benchmarking exercise. Um, here is the. The Madonna on the rocks, version of the rocks, I mean, there are different names sometimes about this. This Leonardo painted about 50 to 20 years er earlier, yeah, much, much earlier. Um, but it's a big painting. It was made for church. It's about two meters high, yeah, much bigger than the Sala of the Mundi. Um, so this has been a trade off. As it's much larger, as usually larger paintings go for high price, yeah. But at the same time, the guy was less well known, so it would have been cheaper. Mm -hmm. And we know from records, Leonardo was paid 250 florins for this. What's a florin? A florin is a gold coin in Florence. It was used for a long, long time. Yeah, but we also know uh, how, how, how it looked like and so on. And um, we can maybe use this also now as a benchmark and say a little bit, cool, can we compare this with, um, with the South of the Monte? Now, here is, here is the idea, uh, and I'm coming back a little bit to Albrecht Dürer, who signed his paintings, and this painting wasn't signed. What were painters like in the Renaissance times? Painters actually, they were like plumbers or electricians. You know, you went to them, you told them what to do, what you want to have. You say, it should be this, this big, I want to have sort of these colors. I want to have four people on the painting, maybe one of them should be me, you know, and, and yeah, maybe you can make three trees here, just do it, okay, and then come back, and we'll look at it, yeah? uh, So these things weren't really signed either, okay? Um, that, that, that's quite interesting. So in, in, the, opera, in, the, in, the, in the Renaissance time in Florence, uh, these kinds of, um, of job, painting job, was about comparable to someone who is an unskilled construction worker. Yeah? So today, you know, uh, we come to this, not every painter is a superstar, yeah? But today, you know, it's science, it's a name, a name is a brand. Look what Andy Wall did. You know, like Andy Wall is a brand himself, you know? Um, at the point of time, this wasn't the case. So when we also consider that the wages remained relatively um, stable, the 250 florins for this painting 
as it was sold. Would have bought you about 12 years of labor of a person. Okay? So you can employ for 12 years an unskilled construction worker. Yeah? That's about the same amount as this painting was sold. Yeah? Now, of course, Leonardo didn't work uh, 12 years on this, uh, so therefore, of course, he, he asked more for this. But you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice benchmark to look at. Now, when we, when we compare this, how much would it be, or how much would you pay for 12 years of unskilled labor today? Yeah? We have like minimum wages and many, you know, kind of uh, uh, regulations. In the United States, um, it's about $37,000. This is what an unskilled construction worker on average would get. You know, times 12 is about $450,000. Now, we can do two things with this. Either use this as a benchmark again, and we're back to this old play where we say, you know, gold standard, and make a calculation. Or we could also say, hmm, here's a painting. Somebody did this. That's maybe what it's worth, fundamentally. Fundamentally, you know, for those of you who do uh, company valuation with me, you know, we always have a fundamental valuation, you know? The fundamental valuation, we do this kind of cash flow methodology and so on, and say, what is this really worth? And then comes the market and say, no, 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 no. We see it differently. It has to do with supply and demand, with psychology, who wants to have it, and so on and so forth. It's like the art market. You know, I look at it and say, okay, fundamentally it's worth 450. Yeah, 1,000. But it sold for 450 million because, among others, there were two countries who are beating their heads over each other just to get hold of this thing. Yeah? And if you have the right people in the room, in this auction, as was the case, yeah, the price may go up into the sky. So, um, as we're here, sort of looking at this interface between art and finance, actually, because you know, bankers usually love charts like this, um, there are also indices in regards to art study, quite many these days. A quite well-known one is uh, the one uh, that's being developed by May and Moses. Actually, Sotheby's acquired just this index. Yeah? It's owned now by Sotheby's. And this, um, this index uh, has about um, 45,000 repeat sales of work in the index, about 4,000 of them are being resold every year on average. Uh, the database goes back for a long time. But what's interesting here is, despite the fact that uh, this, this uh, picture here is stopping in 2008, but between 58 and 2008, when you compare it with the S&P 500, which is one, for those who are not familiar with capital markets, which is one of the major worldwide global stock indices we're using as a benchmark. You know, this is basically seen as a benchmark for investing in shares worldwide in a globally well-diversified portfolio. Well, you see actually that they're going very much in line, you know, some bit up, bit down, you know, at least for the last sort of 50, 60 years. Um, yeah, I mean, art maybe has a bit, bit more yeah, volatile at the end, but otherwise actually a pretty stable investment but not something where it says outrageous, no? No, good. Uh, when we look at among others at these indices, you may say, well, how is this being calculated and done? For an index like this, you need data. You need transactions, you need deals. This is like when you, when you do the same with the S&P 500, with the index, it's a stock index. Well, stocks, shares are traded every day. Here in this house, they trade in New York, trade in London, and so on, you know? We need liquidity, we need transactions, deals. And we want to see the price, for example, on the Royal Street. Um, now, the fact is, only a very small part of the art market is publicly documented. Yeah? And the part that's publicly documented mostly goes through auctions. Yeah? Now, you can imagine when you go to a gallery and you pay, uh, you buy a painting, you pay for this, I mean, nobody will realize this. This is not part of this. Yeah? This is a tiny, tiny fraction of the market we're looking at here. But this drives something like the index. Yeah? Also, we've got to be careful a little bit when we speak about art index. You know, what is it? It's a small part of the art market we actually look into. Okay. Um, 
these are basically the turnovers uh, from Christie's and Sotheby's over the last sort of 15 years. That stops about half year 2014, uh, 17. What you see is um, uh, between uh, 2008, 9, 10, you see this big slump. What is this? Now that's the financial crisis. Yeah, people had other problems than buying art then. They had to fix balance sheets, loans, and banks. Um, it went up and again about 40, 50. Currently, uh, auction houses are a little bit struggling for various reasons. Yeah? Among others, we'll see later on, art fairs are making a huge inroad into the arts market. But uh, they, they, they have been an issue. But we also see on this chart here, sort of what are the key art sub-segments which are auctioned off. Um, and you see here, uh, for example, this green one is contemporary art. Okay, this is a major, major sector. This uh, light blue one is impressionist and modern art, and this is basically most of what in auction houses is traded. This is the chunk of the business what they're doing, and uh, the others are sort of old masters. You see, it's really small. It's 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 not very important regarding revenues. Now, of course, you can imagine this Salvador Mundi blew all the statistics uh, you know, out of proportion and you basically got to clean up uh, statistics for this. But it's a really small part and the Chinese art uh, uh, that, that grew a bit but most recently uh, also here is it's not so attractive. When we look at Chinese, they're starting to buy more and more international European art. Uh, this is a sub-segment just to look into it, part again what we saw before. This is regional, modern, and contemporary art only, okay? So not old masters, we're not looking at this. And say, well, which regions are, are most actively trading here? Well, the arts market primarily is dominated by the US, by the UK, and the rest is relatively small. I mean, when you look at China, you see what's dark here at the bottom is the US and the UK. This is really the chunk of the market, yeah? This is where, where really the action happens. And this is, for example, just a uh, segment, segment of the emerging markets because I finally wanted to see Russia somewhere. Okay? And you also see when you look at the sub-segment of the emerging markets within the contemporary art and modern art, uh, it's mostly the Chinese market, India, and Russia is, I mean, it's there in the green area. It's very really small. Yeah? It's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively unimportant uh, sub-segment. There's not much going on here. Yeah? Uh, but you know, you gotta, of course, uh, take this a little bit grain of salt because, uh, as we know, I mean, we have like 150,000 Russians living in London. And I would ask myself, why not 150,000 Londons live in Moscow? Um, but that's the way it is. And of course, they are driving there, uh, for example, the arts market a lot. There's a lot of money there. So the, the most recent reports tell us that, for example, uh, in, in, we, we have an inflow of capital. Yeah? From, from Russia into London every month of about a billion dollars still, okay? I mean, this is enormous. And that's gonna be reinvested, you know, among others it's art, yeah? And so, therefore, we have to be a little cautious when we over Russia here, yeah? Because you guys are not only sitting here, you're a global player at the end of the day, yeah? Good. Um, just to comment on art fairs, art fairs have beaten into, uh, beaten into the uh, segment of auction houses quite a lot recently, become very popular among collectors but also galleries. As an art fair, which one is happening right now? Are you familiar with this? Yeah, it's Basel. Yeah, right now it's Basel. I don't know for how long, for like 10 days or something like this, two weeks? Yeah, about a week. About a week? Okay, show it even. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, well, we, we have some others, but Basel is really one of the really major ones. We have Miami and, and, and so on, others one. But, you know, this is where major galleries come together. This is like, um, I don't know, like, like an, an auto fair or something like this, you know? It's like many galleries coming together, show artists. And um, for collectors, it's something pretty cool because they, need, they don't need to travel across the world to hunt for art. They go to one place once a year, you know, and then see what's going on. By the way, there's also some social events around this. Um, uh, the, the fairs are known to be pretty selective, which is good and bad news. I mean, the good news is, okay, you don't have to deal with everything. The bad news is many of the interesting artists may be overlooked. And for some galleries, in particular, who are not in the major cities, this is also a quite cool event uh, to, to present themselves. Yeah? 
as it was recently in the United States. And when you look, for example, what's going on in Santa Fe, you will be surprised, you know, what kind of art scene there is. But fact is, there's not so much trading going on. I mean, it's a cool gallery scene, really, really fantastic. Uh, but, you know, people wouldn't necessarily go to Santa Fe, you know, to see some artists. So therefore, this is a quite um, interesting opportunity. The downside in the meantime is, these things have become very, very expensive for galleries uh, to exhibit. Yeah? And some most recently said, we are out of this now. You know, it's too much. It's more and more expensive. It's actually not giving us the traction we really want to have. So we'll see. The final verdict on this is not spoken yet. But fact is, uh, in, in 2016, uh, um, and, and that's confirmed by a recent report, as is about 40%, of the post-war contemporary sales goes through these uh, art fairs, which is a lot. And, and uh, you know, the bill didn't exist. As a Basel, of course, had a long track record, but that there was such a run towards these fairs, that's a, a, a more recent phenomenon. So let's switch over. I was a little bit, so to look into this, why are people, or why do you buy art? And that was a survey done. Uh, actually, Deloitte uh, that has Angular, right? Uh, Deloitte that's in Luxembourg, you know, they make this study. Uh, they have asked recently uh, collectors, what is my art? And uh, that's what came out there. Um, so when you look at those who just buy art as an investment purpose, this is a small, small segment, it's about 5% or something like this, you know, those who really want to trade in art. Uh, we have about a third or so that say we're interested in collecting and enjoy it, or maybe hang it, or impress someone with it. And then there is uh, the largest chunk who say, oh, yeah, maybe we enjoy it, but yeah, maybe we save it one day. No? But you know, investment is not the major focus uh, what most people have here. Nevertheless, um, what is quite interesting, I think what this shows you of the last, <laughs> you can't see this so well, but no surprise, this is about the last 20, 25 years. For every year, it shows you the most expensive painting or deal that was done, yeah? For every year. I look, what you see here, what you see here on top, do you, do you recognize this, the three yellow ones? That's a? Bacon. That's a bacon, okay. Uh, what is below the bacon? That's a Munch, a screen, okay. This Munch, by the way, and that's on top here, that was bought, um, I think it was 11 or 2010 or so, that was bought by US American for 120 million. He uh, is the founder of Apollo. I mean, for those of you doing banking, they may be familiar with this, it's a big private equity fund, yeah? big, big private equity. He bought the Munch for 120, and then he was asked, so more or less, what are you gonna do with it? And the answer was sort of stupid you. Uh, what do you think? I'm not going to flip this the next moment to someone, else, because this guy's a trader, huh, in essence. I'm not going to flip this to someone give me 130 million for this. So it's very clear he bought this to enjoy, but not to impress others. Yeah? And then the other question is, I mean, this guy is filthy rich. He's a billionaire. Okay? And the next question is, okay, if you want to buy something for 100 million, 120 million, who cares? Yeah? Who would you buy? I mean, I, I mean, I know in London a lot of Russians, among others, are buying real estate. Huh? I mean, you know, if you have money, uh, you go to London, buy a flat, paint house, whatever. What's the most expensive flat you can buy in London right now? Actually, it's owned by a Russian, of course. Um, how much? Knightsbridge one. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Knightsbridge one. Looking over Hyde Park. A double penthouse, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not from Harrods, maybe 300 meters away, yeah. How much is it? That's about 100 million, yeah, it's about 80 to 100 million. Okay, I mean, there is nothing more expensive than long you can buy uh, if you want to buy real estate. You can buy maybe, I don't know, an airplane, a 737 private jet, yeah, okay. But the problem is, you know, after five years, it's not worth so much anymore, you know? And then, huh? Oh, hmm? Yeah, and everybody has it anyway, you know? But this moon, there's only one of it. And now, okay, the screen, there's several of them, but just a handful of them. Right? I don't know, there's seven or eight of them. Huh? So the point is, when you look at, at, at something, there's some cleats here, you see, Rotsko, you see, of course, Picasso, there is Van Gogh on the left side, and so on. I mean, you know, why these people buy it? So, <laughs> yeah, mostly among others to enjoy it and praise others. 
And uh, the interesting thing now is, uh, when we look at it for a second or from a macroeconomic point of view, I'll give you a following idea. Um, in the United States, we have the Fed. Yeah? The Fed is sort of what's the finance ministry, more or less. Yeah? And um, what, among others, I mean, here in Russia, the same, what they're doing, they're measuring inflation. No? They're interested in where's the inflation going, no? uh, to steal it with the market. And then they had the idea and said, OK, um, why don't we also include the arts market into our screening of inflationary tendencies? Where do we see here an, an asset bubble developing as a sort of prices going through the roof? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And they did that, and so this is a really good idea. Um, and they did this for a couple of years, and then they said, stop. This is probably the wrong approach. And what they realized is that probably fine art and the fine arts market, and think about it, when we speak about the fine arts market, to a large extent we speak about auctions. And auctions are a tiny part, of course, of the, of the arts market as such, such as the, the auction of the Salt of Mundi. This is probably a subset of an economy which is just dealing with very, very, very rich individuals. This is not for people like you and me. The arts market is dynamic and spending money and throwing money on arts. It is something where I say, this is a club of individuals playing these games. Hmm? So this is probably not the right measure to, to measure inflation. And uh, it's quite interesting when you look at it, what drives the arts markets uh, uh, these days and most recently. It is really this kind of high net worth individuals or ultra high net worth individuals. And I mean, I'll give you just the example. Let's assume, and there are more and more of them. Let's assume there's a couple that has 10 billion Ten billion dollars. Cool. Yeah, they're rich like this. Okay, they have money like that because they've sold the company or they became rich by investing or whatever. Okay. Now they say we spend about ten percent of this on art. This is a billion. I mean, spend a billion on art. Mamma mia! I mean, this is a this is a lot of money. How do you want to recycle this? As a in this example, it's just if you say, okay, I gave me a Picasso for like 40 million, it's like, it's like nothing, you know? I mean, just go and just buy it. The question is just, will you get it? Because there are not so many around of this, yeah? So the issue what we see here is, is this not uh, very much driven by the inequality in societies, okay? And, and frankly, honest, Russia being uh, a prime example for this, suffice to say. But also globally, um, when you look at the top chart, what we see is uh, the red line is the assets that the top 1% of the population owns, and the blue one is what the rest owns. Okay? And right now, we're about at the juncture where about 1% of the worldwide population owns about half of the value of assets, if you want to and 99% on the rest. And this gap is widening further, okay? And the interesting thing, when you look at this chart here, this is a trend uh, over the last about 100 years. Uh, I hope you can read it, but for example, when you look at this blue line here, this, this, this turquoise one, that's about Russia, okay? As you see in Russia, it's a particular extreme here, you know, the gap between the rich ones, or the haves and the have-nots, if you want to, okay? But this is the segment, but that's the reason to some extent why we see such inflationary tendencies in the arts market, why we see these crazy prices right now. Huh? Now good, um, how's this wealth um, in investing in the arts markets uh, distributed globally? Well, not surprisingly, I mean the largest one we have out of the US is just below a trillion. The second one is Asia. Also not surprising, particularly China growing, growing very fast. Uh, we see Europe, and uh, we also have Russia in here with about two and a half percent of the global market or assets that are allocated to arts. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I mean, compared to the population size, I mean, size is quite substantial. But you see, basically, it's the U.S. and Asia, and to some extent, Europe driving these markets. Um, 
Now, what's the conclusion of this? And this is sort of a first indication, should you invest in art or not? Also, if you believe that the society worldwide will again tend towards more equality, okay? So less gap between the haves and have-nots. If you believe this, go into shares, go into your telecom, your steel, your whatever infrastructure, go into this. Huh? If you believe that this gap is going to widen, going further, well, I mean, it's no brainer, you go for it. Okay? It's not quite so, I mean, this is a basic example. It's not quite so because this chart shows the falling. Um, it, it, this red line uh, shows, in essence, the income equality of the United States, as of maybe the share of wealth of the top 0.01%, okay? And they have more and more. But you know, the interesting thing is, when you look at these two indices, this is, the, again, the S&P 500, and this is another art index, my view would be, Naya, this hypothesis, what you have on top, still needs to be tested. So the gut feel is, yeah, this may be right, uh, but I think when you did now some empirical research, maybe we should do this in Russia in one of our diplomas, um, then this is not quite clear yet, or fully proven that this is really the case. But in essence, yeah, it's a, at, at the moment a, a major driver. Now, is this a gold rush at the moment, as to start with? I was just recently in the US, um, and I also ended up in California then. I had to deal with gold rush, of course, because we still find villages there that had been left 89 years ago, and they still go in there, and as someone had left yesterday, who made money in the gold rush? It was definitely not the gold miners. It was all these middlemen. It was these people who were selling you the eggs. It was these people who were shipping in water and food, who provided shelter or whiskey. They made money. Huh? Um, is this with art maybe similar? Well, the interesting thing is, if you are an art dealer today and you're lucky to have some really prominent artists under your umbrella, then the pitch is very simple. The pitch is you have more and more individuals wanting to invest in wanting art. I mean, just as an example of this couple before, when they say, you know, I want to buy Picasso, by the way. Yeah? You are in a pretty, pretty comfortable position to be in. Yeah? The question really is, you know, who makes, who makes the money here? Now, there are two things I want to look at going further. The one is, what's actually really grabbing the headlines? We speak about the art market. No, we speak not about the art market. We speak about a small, small segment of the art market to begin with. And we'll, we'll look now a little bit into this. What does this mean for the individual artist? And the other one is, well, um, uh, what kind of market is this actually? We will look into this. Um, isn't this very much an insider world, this art market? The very small part of it is transparent, open, where they know what the deals are, you know, we're made of, which are registered. Or is it more a rumor mill? Who has the next big show? How was critique? What do people say? You know, and uh, what's been sold privately? We'll look into this. Now, to start with, when we look uh, broadly, these are not formal indices, but sort of indications, which art segments uh, really make money. It is both for contemporary. Yeah? So when you look, of, of course, the ups and downs always. But when we look at, for example, like the old masters, 19th century, and, and, and even the, the kind of more classical modern art, it's, yeah, I mean, there was an up before 2008 and crash, but, you know, when you look at it for the last 20 years, it's pretty, pretty much, you know, same, you know, where we, where we started. Uh, the other two segments actually make money. The second interesting thing is, who are these money spinners, really, among the artists when we speak about the art market? Now, when you look at the first half of 2017, it was these 25 artists that basically accounted for half of the auction sales. Just these 25 artists. Um, was klar, Warhol, Liechtenstein, and of course, Gerhard Richter. You know Gerhard Richter? Yeah, 
Ja, Richter is, is currently the most expensive overall art, living artist that we have right now, about 85 or so. Uh, a very interesting one. Trombley, honestly, I never understood really. Bacon, and then, then come actually some names even I'm not very familiar with. But it's always uh, sort of the same usual suspects who end up there. Yeah? They, this is really, when we speak about auctions and art market, this is it. This is very much it. This is about how the art market. Now, uh, for this, we should take a look for a second how the art market and such work. And, and this is, when I say art market, here primarily mean paintings and maybe sculptures. We have to distinguish it between two markets, the primary and the secondary market. Yeah? The primary market is the artist is painting something and they want to sell. What does the artist do usually? Most of the time, they, they have a gallerist who's doing this. There's hardly ever an example. I mean, Damon Hurst is, is an exemption, and uh, Bogart actually was once an exemption, and that didn't work out. There are hardly artists who say, look, um, I have a reasonably established name, I have 30 new paintings, and I invite 200 people to my studio, let's make an auction. No, this doesn't work. And by the way, this doesn't happen. Gerhard okay, Richter doesn't do any auctions in his studio. There's no way. Yeah? His pieces of art are being placed by his gallerist. Mm -hmm. So the primary market is very much uh, where the gallery is involved in. And you mustn't uh, forget here, and I don't want to go too deep into this, because that's actually another, another session I, you know, years ago at Sotheby's, just looking at this segment of the primary arts market. It was really interesting. Um, for me, for those people coming from finance, this has to a large extent, so let's leave the superstars aside for a second, this has very much to do with like looking at a, a venture capitalist approach. Okay? And let's assume we have a young artist, yeah? starting to paint, three, four, five years still painting, you know, 10 years still painting, and selling slowly. Yeah? Well, how is this person that nobody knows selling her his art? Right, who does the marketing? Uh, who does the introduction to collectors? Who does all this? It's the gallerist. And the gallerist, among others, is also the one responsible for creating price points. Price points over time. And what you wish either to have as an artist is over time that your paintings sell for more. No? As usually what you do is you say, okay, how big is the thing? How many square centimeters or so? And then a certain square centimeters costs a certain amount of dollars, whatever. And you hope this is going to increase every year a little bit. Yeah? But at the same time, you mustn't forget, this is also a safety network for the investor. I intend to say an investor, for the collector. Because the, the collector, you can imagine, takes a high risk with... Agneta Meyer, who nobody knows, instead of a Gerhard Richter that everybody knows, because whether this Agneta Meyer is ever going to be a star or not, nobody knows, right? So you're taking a risk as a, as a collector, and as a collector, you want to make sure that not the next morning, you know, you wake up and the price suddenly crashed 50%, but that it's sort of reasonably keeping value. That is, among others, why we have this gallerist team in between. That's a little bit of price function there. Now, I try to be very positive on this because many people are very critical about this and what gallerists are doing and they say, oh, they take 50% of the price and so on and so forth. So, you know, there are many, many features of this. But fact is, that's the way it works. The primary market with the primary art is to a large extent placed by the gallerists, you know, towards collectors and then either towards a museum maybe or a larger collection and that's already good for your CV and good for your pricing point. Because you can say, oh, you know, I don't know, you know, this large collection, this museum has bought it, you know, quite, I'm hanging in the Tretiakov. Well, that's cool, you know? this is this really looks good, and they should boost your price. You know? This is what the gallery is doing. What we are speaking when we look at all these indices and money and arts market, this is more the secondary market, you know. This is where the auction houses come in where a lot of trading is happening. Yeah? This, this is sort of what we're looking at. As it's very important when we look at the art market also to make a distinction between what we're looking here for. Yeah? Is this the primary market and new 
art is coming to the market, or is it when existing art is being traded? Yeah? Now, um, I brought up this, this quickly because uh, I thought this illustrates a little bit where the artist is and where the money is, by the way. You know? Here's the poor little artist. The, the artist, what's the artist doing? Well, going to art school maybe, spending a lot of money there, you know? um, doing some, some work, spending time there. Maybe uh, this person has a residency somewhere and can start working. But the, the money flows mostly by the gallery through work this artist is producing, which is ending up out there, you know, mostly with collectors, maybe then with some museum, maybe art fairs and so on, if it goes well. Where's the money? Well, the money is here, you know, among foundations, governments, sponsors, and this is sort of the corporate money, trustees, and also individual collectors. I see, you know, Basically, this is where the machine starts rolling. You know, this is not on the artist's side. This is much more than when it's getting out into the liquidity of this commercial segment. Hmm? Okay. Now, um, when we look a little further at the arts market, um, I mean, it's 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 quite goofy when you look at this. Um, in the arts market, you may see transactions where they come. Oh, you know what? Who's the seller? A private collection. Who's the buyer? A private collection. What was it sold for? We don't know. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's an obsessive amount of secrecy in this market. And the other thing is what kicks here as well. I mean, look, when you trade shares, I mean, we're sitting in the stock exchange in Moscow, for God's sake. I mean, selling and buying shares, or when you come the first time to a market for an IPO, I mean, for those of you who do finance, if a company makes an IPO, what do you get in your hand? A prospectus. Have you seen a company prospectus in your life? 600 pages where there's everything in there. You've got to know about the company, the industry, the management, the financials, and for God knows what. Okay? And here you have a market, regulations, any regulations, and I come to this insider trading. I mean, sorry, this market is a pure insider trading machine. I mean, what 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 is what is regulated here? Nothing like this. Okay. So, um, we, for example, we have no register. You know, who sold something to whom? When you buy today a house or a flat, I mean, we have a register. We know who owns the thing. Yeah, we know who bought it, we know even in my country for how much, it's all in there, yeah, we know it. With art, we know, we know absolutely nothing. So, um, the secrecy is not always necessarily negative, you know. You can imagine if, for example, there is, we, also in Austria, we have some family estates, yeah. It's, honestly, to have, for example, a castle is a nightmare, okay. I mean, the roof is leaking, the facade is falling apart. How, how can I fund this? You know, it, it, it's a nightmare to maintain castles. Well, from time to time, these people still have collections and sell all things. Yeah? <sighs> they don't want to be in the limelight. You know? they, wanna, they don't want to be known, maybe that they have even some issues or problems. All the museums, like sometimes secrecy, because you can imagine if. Um, if a major collection or a major museum is buying a piece of art, and you know, you have a lot of scholars there and experts, you know, I, I can tell you, all this money is immediately chasing this as well. I mean, the museum has no chance to buy this thing, right? Because, I mean, they're going to be outbid right away, slam dunk, okay? So, I mean, there may be something which is, which is uh, in, in, in the favor of secrecy. But before we even go further into the secrets of the art market, as a fact is also that today, because we spoke uh, before about this Bouvier, this Freeport King, yeah, about, uh, I mean, it's an estimate, about 80% of the world art is actually lying in warehouses. And nobody knows about it, sees about it. Yeah? Also, I have friends in London who fly sort of every couple of weeks to Geneva, okay? What do they do there? They go to a warehouse. I mean, it's big, but it's not very romantic there, can you believe me? And you know what they do? They say, I want to see my art, okay? And then they're shown their own art. At least every couple of weeks, they want to take a quick look at it and then they fly home again, yeah? Because it's too expensive, uh, you know, there's no way they would hang in the flat because they think it may be stolen. 
or you know, it may be burned or whatever. You know, they're not having the storage there. Huh? And by the way, mostly uh, these kind of free ports, uh, as they're called, uh, they also have some tax benefits because sort of they're outside jurisdiction. And uh, in the meantime, also they do some some events around this. But fact is, a lot of these are being locked away. You know. Um, now, the the question of this like sort of what kind of market is this? This is just some aspects that you should have heard about it or know about it. The first one, it's now partially forbidden in the US by now, but but. I, honestly, when I read this the first time, I said, "What is this?" I had to research myself. I never, I never thought about this exists actually. You know, the Shanghai bid, imaginary bids by auction houses. Now, how would this work? I mean, an auction houses is like here. You know, there's a painting hanging there, and and you guys are bidding. You know, you're bidding by raising your hand. You know, and uh, what this means is uh, the person standing here basically sort of conducting the auction, raises already the bid by looking into the room and candlelight means, okay, the candles may be up there, a luster is, is somewhere hanging, I look there into a spot in the room that the other people can't really see very well because you wouldn't look around and say, who is this bidding here? Yeah. And they mean to say, oh, there must be someone at the back bidding up and then you start bidding as well, okay? This is not partially forbidden, but it still happens. Okay, I mean, can you imagine? This is uh, unbelievable. Auction strategy for young yet to be established. Okay, I didn't write this down because I'd rather tell you about this, yeah? Because I don't wanna, wanna see this thing floating around. The following is not illegal. And, and frankly honest, I'm, I'm close to once try this out, yeah? So, following. You have an artist friend, yeah? And maybe not so successful. And then they say, look, you know, I anyway know you're, you're in not so good shape. I, I buy 10 or 20 pieces from you, yeah? $10,000, whatever, yeah, I give you this. I know, you know, okay, gotta do it. Um, next, I mean, you know, we have Facebook, Twitter these days, you know, you, a little bit, you make some photos, you, you may you know a journalist is writing something about this artist. They create a little bit of fuss about this. Next, uh, you bring one of these 10 or 15 or 20 paintings to an auction house, okay? And this goes on auction, this one painting. Who else is in the room? Two or three of your friends, okay? And what we do is we start with maybe a thousand. No, let's assume there were 10 paintings for 10,000. No? Uh, we start here with a thousand uh, minimum price, 500 for God, you know? And we're starting the auction, and the friends pay uh, 1,200, 1,500, 1,700, uh, 2,000, 2, 3, 2, 5. Okay, stop, fine. You get it for 2, 5. <laughs> Friend of mine. Okay, well, of course, nobody knows. So you pay the auction house, the fee. What do we have? A data point. The gallery has a data point to say, huh, you know, in the auction, just three weeks ago, a painting of this artist sold for 2,300. Okay, let's do this again. As you can imagine, what kind of, that's possible. It's, it's not illegal, it's completely legal. You can do it, it's not regulated, yeah? That's possible. Okay, good, I gave a big secret away to you. Um, guarantees, guarantees. As what happens is, in auctions these days, uh, it may be as a, a painting comes for for auction, okay? And um, someone says, "Look, if this painting doesn't go away, I guarantee I'm gonna buy it at a certain minimum price." And this is of course quite comfortable, you know. At the end of it for the seller, but also for the auction house, we also don't make a fee. Um, problem is, nobody knows about this. Um, you don't know that there is a guarantee out there, you don't know who the guarantor is, you don't know what the guarantee price is, you know nothing about this, okay? And in the meantime, people are bidding like hell. So just think about it, yeah, and then, and then uh, you know, what do you get at the end of it? If the painting is crossing the guarantee line, yeah, then whatever is on top of this, probably maybe split between auction house seller and the guarantor. 
of whom you don't know who, who this person is. Now, if you for a second think about if this had happened with the Salvatore Mundi, yeah? Let's assume someone got in, 450 million, okay? Someone got in and said, I guarantee 100 million. And if it goes through the roof, um, then I take a certain part of this, because I was at risk. No? I could have uh, sold for 70 and then I'm on the block, you know, for the difference. Right? But it shoots through the roof. Now, um, as a, first of all, you can make money. But even if the guarantor had made the final winning bid, what would have happened? We would have said, hey, you know, by the way, um, I was participating in part of the upside, wasn't I? Uh, and I should have got maybe a third of what's over my, my price. Well, 100 million guarantee, 450 million it went. So uh, a third, uh, well, could have got this model for free, okay? Because this is the fee sort of I get back for taking the risk and providing the guarantee, yeah? But you know, you see, hey, wait a second, I mean, is this regulated somewhere? I mean. No, nobody knows about this, okay? As a, I, I just with this Shanley bidding, with the strategy for the young artist and the guarantees, I, I, I show a little bit, I mean, that is what you're dealing with, you know? When you, for example, you know, participating in an auction, and, and clearly this is rather for auctions and rather for larger lots, but if you were, for example, a fund, my God, we have art funds these days, I mean, this is certainly something you're gonna watch out for, you know? So, by the way, guarantees, how much is guaranteed? Uh, in the first half of, of 27, uh, the view is in both Europe and, and uh, the US, it's about half. Half of the, half the lots are being guaranteed. Yeah. Good. Uh, I leave this out for time reasons. Uh, I may come back later. Arts market channel characteristics. Um, we, we've heard this by now, just sum it up. It's a artist clearly unique. Yeah? Uh, by the way, think about dead artists, elasticity of supply, what does it mean? It means, you know, once an artist is dead, there's no more supply, there's nothing there anymore. And so these things, usually the prices go up. Huh? And some galleries are barely waiting for this, you know? I mean, once the person's dead, the price should actually go up. Monopolies, uh, this is very much macro. Of course monopolies are there. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, the one who has a unique piece has the monopoly in it, sitting on it, you know? And if there's someone else who wants it, well, you know, uh, the price will settle. Um, dividend interest, of course, not there. Liquidity low. Um, objective evaluation. I mean, think about when we do in my classes NPV approaches and all this. Do this with a piece of art. Not going to work. Transparency low. Transaction costs are very high. So when you look at, when you go into gallery here, I mean, I, I don't see Moscow's different than Vienna, London. I mean, on average, Unless it's a super expensive one, 50 percent, 50 percent goes to the gallery. Okay, if I went direct to the artist, it cost me half, two thirds. Yeah. Um, sorry, what else do we have here? Unregulated, we have here. Yeah, clearly. I mean, till you as a buyer have expertise, if you're new to the art market, that's going to take a long, a long time. And risk forgery. I mean, just some some aspects here. Now, nevertheless, when you're an investor. Um, Adding the asset category of art to your overall portfolio, of course, provides further diversification. I don't want to go too much into this, but fact is, it reduces the overall risk of your portfolio which you have. Um, it is, in essence, a hedge against inflation. Good news is the principle should be somehow protected this long time. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the rest, the rest uh, I think we'll leave out here. Here's getting more interesting, I think, for us. Uh, estimated returns from collectibles. This is for the last about 100 years. How did certain asset categories do? We, we saw it before already, you know, when we did the Monday. But um, global equities, somewhere uh, five plus percent. Wine, hey, forget about art, go for wine. Uh, wine, three, three and a half percent. I mean, if you keep it too long, probably you're gonna end up with vinegar. Uh, this is not a good idea, but, but you know, it's, it's probably worth the risk. I was very surprised with stamps. I found it so boring. I have to look for my stamp collection again that my grandmother gave me many, many years ago. Violins, 
okay, global bond part, and then we have more this kind of uh, usual um, inflation hedges like, like uh, uh, gold, particular silver, diamonds. Now, estimating returns over all these asset categories is, of course, a bit tricky. But when you see returns like this, you've got to be a bit cautious here. Um, as a first of all, uh, some of the indices are not really complete and, and very good, very well um, uh, reflecting a market. Second, don't forget, I mean, what's in this index, particularly looking back 100 years? Well, usually the good works, the good things survive. I mean, if a painting is bad, you may burn it one day, you know what I mean? Uh, or a violin, which is not, uh, you know, I mean, Stradivari you will keep, okay? I mean, Stradivaris will survive. But if it's not a Stradivari, uh, if it was one of these $200 or whatever, I mean, you probably throw it away one day, you know? Uh, so you gotta get a check out here. Transaction cost, I mentioned before, like in the art scene, uh, uh, quite a lot. Insurance costs, of course. Um, yeah, and, and, and then you clearly gotta take a look at uh, inflation edge, yes or no, and also, of course, volatility. I mean, that the arts markets are more volatile than, uh, you know, some other assets is clear. That's just for my students, basically. When I look at this, and say, damn, global equity is 5%, what about the market risk premium? And I teach you all the time it's 7% for the US capital markets and we're gonna apply it for other markets as well. Okay, you have a point, yeah? Uh, I still need to look into this. Um, these are some indices of collectibles. Um, the, uh, what's quite interesting is, uh, yeah, so, okay, uh, we have the world equities on top. Um, but uh, where is here, where are the cars? Yeah, the cars are with 242 actually. Cars are doing pretty well, yeah? But also here, I mean, which cars survive? The good ones, expensive ones, no? Those you don't, don't throw away. The good old, old timers, no? Other ones not. Um, I so this is sort of, uh, yeah, this is sort of a little bit looking back 100 years. Um, but it's not so, it's not so exciting. It's, it's actually pretty interesting that between the 50s and the 70s, it's pretty much lagging behind uh, the overall um, uh, capital markets. And this is also quite interesting because, you know, it, it's been over the last sort of 20 years that real estate suddenly is, is such a hip category. Uh, honestly, when I started banking, nobody spoke very much about real estate. Now it's, it's everything, I mean, in this country, you're obsessive here with real estate, yeah? Everything's about real estate. Um, and. When you look at it clearly, uh, most recently, uh, the real estate, uh, you see this on top, um, has been performing for much better than art, I would say, rather, you know, would have fared much better. But also here, in regards to real estate, you've got to be cautious with these indices, because um, what about maintenance and insurance and also transaction costs and all this, which is not necessarily included here. Good. Um, at the end, you know, it's about half past now. He's one of my favorite artists. Yeah? He's, uh, he's come from China. I, you, you know what I like? Yeah? Okay. Uh, he's a, a real cool guy. As a, first of all, I like him because he doesn't like everything what happens in Beijing. Um, but the other thing is, he's pretty revolutionary in his concepts and thoughts. Yeah? And um, I give just a, you see what he's doing here. I mean, at, at the front you have some vases. Uh, sometimes what he's doing is he's taking the old mink ones, you know, and repainting it. But even worse, you may say, what's happening back here? Well, he's crashing one. You know? It even goes that far that he was grinding some of them. You know, but he's actually criticizing this whole art market because uh, the the whole starting point of the session was art invest in an asset. And here we go to this asset category. People are buying the dust from grinded former Ming vases made by Mr. Ai Weiwei for a fortune. Okay, it's dust. Yeah, Mr. Ai Weiwei did it. Okay, I said he's kidding himself a little bit. I said, I mean, honestly, what is this? Yeah, I know these people are happy to I don't know, you know, put hundreds of thousand dollars or millions of dollars for this because this formula was a Ming vase and I have not pulverized it, okay? But um, it, is, it, is kind of, it, it is sort of interesting to watch it this, to also see critically what is art all about, you know, and when and under which circumstances do we attach a value to this, you know? When 
in essence, this matter has ceased to exist. There's nothing else than dust anymore. And still people get excited about it. Good. Now, so what to do? I hate these things, by the way. There is nothing like to do. And there's no advice you will get from my side whatsoever. Personally, because I just said this at the beginning, as my view, I think art is not for investing. I think this is complete bullshit. Yeah? Art is something you should really like, something you should have an attachment to, or you like the artist, okay? Um, but just to go for an investment, you're not gonna make it anyway. This is like, I mean, this is like you, you hunting for, for startups and you say, I wanna find a new Apple or Google. You're not gonna find it. You will be extremely lucky if, if you're the first shareholder in such a company. This, really forget it, it's not gonna happen, yeah? It's the same with, with art to an extent, yeah? It is mostly when you and really speak about not ordinary people like you and me, you know, when we go and buy art, honestly, yeah, you may make money at the end of the day, but most of the time I tell you, if you buy a piece of art, you're not gonna sell it probably. Yeah, maybe if you inherit it, you may sell it, okay? But, I mean, frankly, I've never sold any piece of art that I bought, never, never. Because some artists I know, you know, and, and, and some things I really like, I like, you know, I want to look at them, no? Okay, um, then, of course, work with the Kenny Ford, man, that's a no-brainer. Um, despite the fact it's very interesting, I remember years ago, okay, here's a story. I started in a small little country called Austria uh, with a small little bank called Kreditanstalt, which is today part of the credit, okay? Now, um, you, you know maybe Chile means something to you? Egon Chile? Yeah, Egon Chile? Okay. In Vienna, we have a lot of Egon Chile, yeah? And we have a museum there, it's Leopold Museum. Mr. Leopold's very funny. Uh, I knew the guy, still, he, actually this was the biggest mistake in my life. He asked me to be a CFO. And me, idiot, I didn't accept. You know, I, I, I continued in banking. Yeah, and I, because I really, really liked art. And he just set up this museum, the Leopold Museum in Vienna, okay? So Mr. Leopold was obsessive about Chile. As a student already, he was an eye doctor. As a student already, he started buying uh, Sheila's because Sheila was completely out of fashion. Everyone said there's pornography, you know, and said, oh, how can you buy it? Yeah. He, could, he could get this for a bargain, you know, Sheila's. And he bought Sheila. He just, like I said, he's a genius. He bought it, bought it, bought it. Now, yeah, like it is with many of collectors, uh, these deals got bigger and bigger and more and more. I mean, he needed money, yeah? Now, where do you go when you need money? You go to a bank. And the house bank, we were his house bank, Kreditanstalt. So Mr. Leopold came from time to time, you know, looked at his paintings. We had some in the cellar of Kreditanstalt, you know, on Ringstraße. But at the same time, you know, whenever he wanted to buy a new one, a new Schiele, the question was for us in the bank, uh, he wants to have a loan again for whatever, 10 million uh, for painting. Shall we give it? And then the problem was that, well, can we have any expert on Shiva? And they would say, yeah, it's me. I mean, he was, he was the guy. He was really the guy. He was the Mr. Shiva. I mean, yeah, I mean, there was nobody else around there, you know? So he was basically also telling you whether this is worth something or not, you know, Mr. Mr. Leopold. But the thing is, yeah, when you say work out what you can afford, uh, yeah, I think for you and me, this is probably the right thing to do. But fact is, yeah, when you have art uh, in, in, or art funds, I mean, you know, paintings, of course you can pledge them. You can offer them as a security. Yeah, you, you can, it's better there's no very liquid. Well, when you make an investment, research it. Yeah, this is easy to say. This will take a long time till you actually build up this expertise. Work out how long you can hold it for. This is really for someone to flip art. But as I said, um, as of my personal view now is, um, I, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I mean, fact is, yeah, there are funds around. And I say yes. I mean, de facto, it exists. I mean, I can't ignore it. But I'd say there's so many aspects that speak when you look at the market overall and what art is against, you know, trading in it. I mean, there is no commoditization of pieces of art. No, they're unique. What are, what are they talking about? This is not oil, you know, or I say oil, oil is oil is oil. Uh, it's not. So, here we are, and that's what I, what I leave you with. 
I think we can do some Q&A. I have some more questions that I got, what I haven't tackled um, uh, yet, which are on my list uh, that I can do later on. But for the time being, I'll make a break. Is this good? Alex, say good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> There's another aspect of mass market that we haven't mentioned, yeah. it's online sales. Oh yes. Which have grown like 72% in the recent years. That's from the latest article. Not most recent. The, the late, uh, I read this morning. 8%. But 8%? Yeah. But, and it was flat. Yeah. That's the interesting thing. The online market, it's there. Uh, but the online market is very interesting, is actually way below the online market that we see in any other segment. I mean, clearly, art is not books. Yeah, I mean, you can't put it on Amazon. It, it, I mean, the fact it's there, but also the fact is for the big investors, nothing for people like you and me who make over. I'm even subscribed to some of them. I see it in my own behavior. Buying online piece of art, I want to see it first. You know, you know what I mean? It's kind of. It exists, it's about 8%. So 8% of the global art market right now is online. It has grown a lot. Uh, I have a friend, for example, at, at Sotheby's in London who is responsible for this. I'm proud, a former student of mine from Vienna. I always, you know, I remember when she had her first job at Christie's, she needed a recommendation. And I wrote a recommendation for someone like a financial analyst, you know. <laughs> I was, of course, completely wrong. But, um, but the point is, uh, most recently, so right now it's a little bit like flattish, okay? We'll, we'll see, you know, where this is going. But at the moment, no. The question really is, is this? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, because absolutely. you can skip this uh, gallery, dealer, and auction. That's a very interesting yeah. aspect. As a look, if I were, I mean, in, in this country, sorry, so many things don't work here, yeah? But, the, the, the one thing is very interesting. You have really still a lot of good entrepreneurs in the area of IT. This seems to work. And, and they're not necessarily in Moscow, they are the Novosibirsk, the Akadem Gorodok, and they are, they are everywhere. Tomsk and whatever. Okay? Good. If I had one single idea what I would do in regards to innovation, and for God's sake, this, this country has to produce something else innovation than Kaspersky. I mean, you know, I mean. Okay, it would be blockchain technology for art in the arts market. Now it's easy to say, of course, and the arts market is continuing, and they got to start somewhere. But I think for like uh, particular young artists, young art, that in my view is an opportunity because you saw how this market works with all this no regulation, no transparency, no records, nothing at all. You know. Um, that's what I would do. I mean, I'm too old for this already, you know, but, but that, is, that is something. That would be something. Uh, I'm, I'm less extreme probably about the cryptocurrencies and all this, but blockchain in the art market, hmm, this would be something delicious to look into. Okay, magic word, the blockchain, which you just every single time you... Yeah. So even in this art, Mm. Still, yeah. 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 So we have, we have a question there. Oh. Oh, yeah. 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 Ye
you know, art for this. It's not quite what we see, you know, online crowdfunding, but... Mm. This is one aspect of crowdfunding. I mean, I, I, I invite 10,000 of other people to buy Monet or Renoir, for example. And we together go and pay yeah, five thousand. Then we're back to the online and art, and 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 this is even earlier stage. I mean, look, I'd say why not if you have a, an art project? As I said, the way I got dragged into this by coincidence was a friend of mine wanted to make an installation, and she needed a couple of thousand dollars then. Yeah, and and that was exactly the moment when I got in and say, you know what, you need a business plan. Okay, and I said, oh, we need a, what's the purpose, oh, what's the budget, what's the timetable, why is this good for you, you know, how this is, you know, this usual, mm -hmm. and you do this with an artist together, no? Um, could you do something like this, like a crowdfunding platform? <sighs> Theoretically, why not? I mean, have a business plan, sort of, for the sculpture installation, I mean, in theory, why not? Mm -hmm. you know? Not in theory. There was a case, a practical case, about what you say about mm. a thousand people buying a work of art. Uh, a few years ago, Tate Gallery wanted to buy a new Turner painting for their collection. Ah, sure. And they okay. started the crowdfunding campaign, yeah. they put actually a very high resolution photo of the painting yeah. on the website, and you could click on a particular fragment of yeah. the painting and buy this fragment. Oh, really? And so all the people together bought the same painting. That's a good one. Yeah, as a, it, it's quite interesting. I wouldn't think about this. We know these models. We call them, I don't know what the right expression in English is, Partnerschaften, you know? It's kind of, you do this with orphans sometimes as well. You're like Pate, you're helping this child sort of to develop. And, uh, you know, you may do this. You may say, look, yeah, we have this in Vienna Kunsthistorische Museum too. We have actually folders and they want to even acquire something or... But most of the time, to be honest, such initiatives are supported by trusts, particularly in London. So if you go to the um, if you go to the National Gallery in London, of, of course they have big brains, you know, and they have in their various committees very rich people or, or foundations or, or family offices sitting, and they have money. And most of the time, it's going through these platforms that they say, "Oh, okay, there is an opportunity not to buy this painting. There's no way through a budget we can do this. We need help." And then they buy this, and then you have a small little uh, plate below, say supported by, and then you have this in the trust, and this in the family. And, mm. um, I think this is not crowdfunding, to be honest, but because also you have to be very fast by, by acting to this. I mean, if a, a piece of art comes up for sale, you've got to have the money. I mean, it's not that, that you can go around and say, we do crowdfunding. Uh, you know, to, when, when you're done, this is gone already, this opportunity. So, you know, I think you've got to think about it for which opportunities you use it, you know? Because, I mean, crowdfunding, as you know, also this may take quite a long of time, you know, and you don't know whether it's going to be successful or not at the end of the day. You know? okay. uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, Damien Hurst. Ah. For example, <laughs> if you look at Damien Hurst's exhibition, how uh, he finds financing for his project. For example, last project in Venice, Prego Pantelini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damon is a fantastic businessman. Huh? Damon Hurst is a fantastic businessman. Uh, I'm, I'm cynical. I've seen his art. I, to a large extent, I don't understand it, to be honest. Uh, this is about what he's doing, okay? Damon Hurst started um, with things like the shark, this is a very famous uh, piece of art he did. Um, you must imagine it's a real shark, it's cut in half, okay, and it's in an aquarium with what they put in naphthalene or whatever, okay? It's preserved. And we can look at it. Okay, and I was standing in the Tate Modern for, for quite a while, among others. Okay? Um, he does other things as well. A very famous is his, uh, I don't know what the name actually, it has a name. The skull with the diamonds, it has a name that I can't recall right now. In the love of God. Say again? In the love of God. Thank you. Okay, good to you. you know. um, I, I don't know exactly how it's worth, but I could recall this was somewhere between just the material value, it's full with diamonds, it was about 20 to 40 million, I mean, you know, just to, to, to make this, this, this whole thing. And, um, what Damon Hurst did, and I come back to what I said briefly before, Damon Hurst, of course, broke the rules. 
And um, that was in September 2008. Now, 2008, fun enough, was um, what was happening then? Well, the financial crisis, you know, starting there. But he just made it just, just before. Uh, he actually decided against the rules, what I said before, that usually primary art is sold through a gallery. He said, no, we make an auction. And there was a two day auction in September. We auctioned more than 200 works, we did. Um, uh, they generated uh, more than 100 million sterling. And in today's world, honestly, when I say 400 million for this event, this doesn't sound much, right? This is like 10 years ago. But by then, this was, he made more money today than all the artists in the National Gallery together in their lifetime, okay? This was an enormous amount. Nobody had ever heard about something like this. It was an enormous amount he had raised. Now, he did an auction himself, his primary art, okay? Without the galleries. Um, however, you know, some of the uh, lots did better than others. Um, some actually didn't attract uh, a, 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 lot of, a lot of buyers. But in essence, what he wanted to show is he wanted to show this works in particular, you know, that he didn't want to pay the fees towards the galleries. Because, I mean, usually gallery asks for 50% and not honestly for these big lots, you know. And so, uh, usually when you go to a gallery and you buy for a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand uh, um, uh, dollars a painting, that's yeah, about 50%. But frankly, the higher the price gets, the lower the commission of the gallery becomes. But still, it's a lot of money, believe me. So what happened now is, um, uh, not only he's a businessman, but also because there was a transparency and it was so unique, uh, there was a Damon Hurst index created around his art only, okay? Because I mean, the guy, the guy is extremely clever. I mean, it's really cool what he's doing. But fact is um, that since he did this auction, the prices of his average work really hasn't recovered, okay? Um, by the way, there were always some rumors, and, and I'm not too familiar with this, uh, in, 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 in all honesty, and I haven't asked around this, that maybe his gallerists that he had at the time, but because by 2008 he still was working with gallerists, but he went on his own with this auction, that they may have, may have been involved in this and maybe have bid it up the one or the other piece. Uh, that's not, not quite clear. But the fact is, uh, the index, uh, uh, the Damon Hurt index has in essence collapsed. And the question is now, he had in Venice last year um, a big show again. I think it wasn't only his art, it also was his collection as far as I recall. It was not only his art, I think it both. Because he's a, he's a, a really, really vivid collector of, of, of art, uh, Damon Hurt. And you know, I haven't seen very much, you know, whether this has recovered. What I can show you though is yeah, is following. Um, this is a little bit of benchmark with other artists. Um, the first one is Jeff Cohn, okay? Uh, he's one of the superstars in the US. And the other one is Richter, yeah. This is this Richter what, what we had before, the German, no? And this is a little bit sort of the average price, whatever this may be, per lot uh, over the last sort of 20 years of uh, Jeff Combs vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Damon Hurst. Hurst is blue, okay, in both charts, and the other one is Gerhard Richter. Yeah? And of course, in both cases, you see that around 2008, there was still peak, then you have the crisis, and the markets are crashing. But you see that, for example, like Richter, you know, has, has uh, you know, even established himself way over, you know, where previously the top was, and with Cohn is a little bit more volatile. But you see, Hearst has actually stayed relatively flat. This is ending of 2016, and this is before the Venice uh, uh, thing, and since then, honestly, I haven't seen much uh, that he has sold. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Huh? But I, I will hopefully fly to London soon. <laughs> Check out. <laughs> okay. I thought that's about, about Hearst. Yeah. Because it, that's, an, that's a very interesting case. Hearst is, is really interesting to watch. Yeah? Hmm? Could this uh, consider to the tort? To? Tort. Tort? Yeah. What is tort? Such a big No, no, no. What, what, what Hearst did is not illegal, okay? I mean, you can imagine. Uh, and again, I don't know too much about this, but the gallerists he had, we had worked with, weren't really happy about this. Yeah? I mean, look, 
put yourself in the shoes of a gallerist. If you're a gallerist and you start new, and you start with new artists, you invest quite a lot of money into young artists. You know, you give them room, uh, you maybe support them financially, you build prospectuses uh, and, and, and books, you make calls, you organize shows, etc., etc. And the first couple of years, that's probably not much activity. And you know, when you have a portfolio of I don't know ten artists, maybe one will be really well, you know, doing well. Maybe two, three will doing so so, and the rest honestly will disappear. Not. It's like a venture capital fund. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you then have such a superstar, now of course you're part of the success. You know, I mean, this may be years ago, but you're, you're part of the story. And so um, it wasn't illegal. No, there was nothing illegal. Uh, the lesson, though, is, uh, and we, we had uh, an auction. Oh God, I forgot the year when he did it. Coca. Uh, you know Coca a little bit, yeah. Uh, so he did, uh, you know, uh, okay, Europe, but then he went to, where did he paint a lot? Hmm? No idea. Polynesia went out there, okay? And the thing is, I mean, you can imagine when you take uh, 120 years ago or something like that, I don't know when, actually, he did just two or three trips uh, down there. Uh, this was a long journey, no? I mean, till you get there, it's like months, you know. And so, I mean, you sell off a lot of stuff and then you take the boat and, and take it. And he made an auction himself. So he's before Damon Hurst, really a prime example, doing that. I think in the case of Gauguin, it didn't work out at all. So his, his paintings really didn't sell well. I mean, he would have done much better than the galleries. Hurst did well, very well, in his auction. But since then, he hasn't recovered. And the problem is, to some extent, not only himself, it's the market. Yeah? But if you don't have, maybe, I'd say, the support of a gallerist who then places art, I mean, what a gallerist is doing quite often, it's not only organizing what you see in the front. 90% of the work of a gallerist is happening in the back office. Okay, behind. You don't see this. This is not where you walk into a room and, you know, and see all these nice paintings on the wall. This is a small part of the gallery. What the gallery really is, is the desk behind, the phone call, the Rolodex, okay? And this is this bit in place in art, okay? This is, this is what a gallery actually is really doing, you know? This is much less glamorous than you think, yeah? And Hearst didn't but seem not to have to support them because by 2012, uh, they split uh, with his main gallerists and hers. I, I, I don't know today, but I think he's still on his own most day. I, I, I don't think he's working with any gallerist at the moment. No? He's on gallery. I think in London he has. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think also he has other art there. This is what's what's so interesting. Yeah, I think what I read like is because he's collecting and he's other art as well, not only his own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have some very large questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah.